Okay. I am Anne Marie LaFasso, Associate Dean for Faculty Research and Development of the West Virginia University College of Law, and I welcome all of you to the John W. Fisher Lecture in Law and Medicine at the West Virginia University College of Law. This lecture series highlights the importance of interdisciplinary work, which is a vital aspect of the acquisition of knowledge. The importance of dis interdisciplinary work is especially true for our field law. What I mean by that is simple. Lawyers are society's prob problem solvers. Someone comes to us with a problem, and we use our training in logical reasoning and analytical thinking to pose solutions to those problems to better society. The marriage of law and medicine is an especially powerful combination because it allows those trained primarily in analytical thinking and those trained in the treatment and prevention of disease to come together in concerted effort to make healthcare accessible to all people and to allow people to live longer, healthier, and higher quality lives. With these values in mind, it is with great delight that I tell you that today's lecture series was made possible through the generosity and the vision of a medical doctor, Dr. Thomas S. Clark, his wife, Jean Clark, and their two sons, Chad and Stuart. It was established in 1998. The Law and Medicine Lecture is one of 10 lecture series that this magnanimous family created across the university and across various disciplines with the focus of bringing those disciplines together to solve what sometimes seem to be, at least at first glance, insoluble problems. This particular lecture, the one in law and medicine, honors the Clark's friend and our dear friend, John W. Fisher. It was created in his honor when he became the 15th Dean of the College of Law. And John Fisher is here today, he's in the back, Please help me welcome him. I highly recommend to the 1Ls to get a John Fisher property outline. He is the guru of property law in the state of West Virginia. Returning to the Clarks, the Clarks are very loyal mountaineers. Dr. Clark earned his medical degree at WVU in 1975 and became the medical director and vice president of Myelin Pharmaceuticals and the former CEO and owner of Clinical Pharmacologic Research Incorporated. He also served on the Mon County Board of Education and the West Virginia Board of Medicine. His wife, Jean Clark, completed her BA at WVU in 1967 and a master's in education in 1974. She served on the University Foundation's Board of Directors. Together with their sons, they decided that they wanted to continue their commitment to WVU through this lecture series while also honoring John W. Fisher, who was the first William J. Mayor Dean and now is the William J. Mayor Dean Emeritus. On behalf of the College of Law community, our thanks go out to the Clarks for their generosity and for their recognition of the important and beneficial connections between law and medicine. I would now like to turn the mic over to Sean, Professor Sean Tu, one of our rising stars here at WVU Law, who himself has married the fields of law and medicine. He has a JD from the University of Chicago and has a PhD in pharmacology from Cornell University. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start out by saying how excited I am to have uh, one of the real leaders in the health field here uh, with us today. It's a real honor to introduce Professor Gostin. Um, I could start with many, one of many of his accolades, so, so I will. <laughs> uh, Professor Gostin received his JD from Duke University and was a Fulbright Fellow at Oxford University. He's also received honorary degrees from Cardiff University and the University of Sydney. By the way, you've always known that you've made it when universities are willing to give you free degrees. Um, he's a member of the President's Task Force on the National Health Care Reform. He was an executive director of the American Society of Law, Medicine, and Ethics. 
He's received several lifetime achievement awards, including one from the uh, Public Health Law Association. He is on the editorial board of 29 scientific and legal journals, uh, including one of the most prestigious medical journals, the Journal of uh, America, the American Medical Association. He's on 24 boards in the U.S. Uh, focusing on health law and AIDS policy. He's on 16 international boards and nine boards in the U.K. He's the author of 46 books, 14 monographs, 75 book chapters, and over 350 uh, journal articles. And I, I, I have to say, right? <laughs> I, I have to say, I, I say over 350 because uh, I stopped counting after page 13 of 45 of his CV, and I was only at 2002. Okay, now for the fun stuff. Um, I have three fun facts about Professor Gostin. First fun fact is that he really takes public health to heart. He bikes to, to and from work every day, 20 miles each way. Um, however, he's not always been successful in taking uh, public health to heart. He once tested to see if, he, if his gas grill had a leak, and how did he do this? With a match, of course, <laughs> right? So from what I understand, several eyebrows were lost in that endeavor. Okay, second fun fact, he brings his family to work. He is fond of starting uh, out his lectures with a story about how one of his sons got a little bit too deep into Nietzsche, and when he was studying philosophy, uh, started telling him that public health sucked all the fun out of life. So hopefully that's not the case. Okay, third fun fact, he takes uh, his work with him everywhere. Uh, he once traveled to every continent except for Antarctica within a six-month period, and he's always had an adventurous spirit. Uh, he hitchhiked from Florida to Alaska during law school, and I believe one of the people that gave him a ride required him to skin a rabbit as payment. <laughs> okay, he's nodding his head, so, so the facts are true. Okay, interestingly, he decided that his children should share in some of that adventurous spirit. Uh, he surprised one of his sons at graduation by telling him that he secured a, him a job in Switzerland at the World Health Organization. Note that his son asked him specifically not to do so, <laughs> and his girlfriend at the time was not pleased, <laughs> quote unquote. Okay, so perhaps one of the greatest accolades of Professor Gostin is raising a son that he could be proud of, Harvard Law, Cravath, uh, and not too shabby, now, now DOJ. Uh, and more importantly, he's raised a son that, who, is, who is very proud of his father. Kieran says hello, and I have to thank Kieran for all of these fun facts. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the intellectual superstar, the adventurous spirit, and the proud parent, Professor Larry Gostin. Thank you so much. That was the nicest introduction I had ever heard. He knows my son, Kieran. That's how he got, that's how he got all that stuff from him. And one little thing. Kieran didn't say that public health sucked the joy out of life. He said, I did. <laughs> And I'm going to proceed to do it now with you. <laughs> and Anne, thank you for uh, that. I don't know if you students realize, I, I know John Fisher does, uh, and hello. <laughs> um, you are so privileged to be here. This is an amazing place. Not, it's, it's, it's scholarly. Uh, it's, it teaches you all of the values of human and social interaction and love of the law. Um, I just think this is a great, great place and it's a, it's a, it's, um, I, I'm sure you realize it and I just wanted to make sure that you do. Um, so I am going to talk on the subject of imagining um, global health uh, with justice uh, and uh, it's based upon the, the last chapter of, of my global health law book that was just published. I want to um, I want to begin uh, by talking about two global health narratives that I've been observing uh, recently, um, and then once I have uh, discussed three questions, which I think are the three overriding questions in my book, and I actually think they're the three overriding questions maybe of life, because I believe health is life. And what your mother told you is true. If you've got your health, 
you've got everything. Uh, and so how do we get to global health with justice? If we could only answer three questions, we could do it. One is, what would, a, what would an ideal state of global health look like? Two, how could we achieve global health with justice? And three is, what are the innovative governance and legal and health and finance tools to get us there? I think those are three foundational questions that I do explore in the book. Um, but my life has been completely taken over for the last month. I mean completely taken over um, by the Ebola crisis. An enormous, unnecessary humanitarian disaster. And so at the end, I want to reflect on that. You can ask me some questions uh, about, about that if you, if you wish. Um, so that's, what my, that's how I'm going to proceed today. Let me begin by these two global health narratives. So I don't know if you've seen in the last month or so, um, but Bill Gates, uh, the Director General of WHO, uh, Margaret Chan, uh, uh, a whole range of Bill Clinton, uh, Mike Bloomberg, have all been uh, going on a charm offensive. This was before Ebola, I should say, because now uh, I think it's sucked all of the air. Um, out of the, the joy that they had had about how wonderful we're doing in global health. And we are. Um, you're too young to remember uh, the beginning of AIDS and the AIDS, how the AIDS pandemic unfolded. But now we have uh, millions and millions of people on antiretroviral medications um, throughout the world. Um, we've got child and maternal uh, health doing better than it ever has. Um, we're on the verge uh, of uh, eradicating polio, even though we do have po pockets in Pakistan and, uh, and Syria. Uh, and we uh, have done extremely well with tuberculosis. We actually uh, may have a malaria vaccine soon. And even with Ebola, um, just about three or four days ago, uh, the NIH, uh, held the first clinical trials for an Ebola vaccine. Um, it's very late, but we still um, managed to do it. And so I think, I think uh, Bill Gates and Bloomberg and, uh, and Margaret Chan's idea in doing this charm offensive was just simply to say, let's not give up. It's not that daunting. You know? But they portray it as a great success, and it is. And the thing that strikes me about these two narratives is, is that they're opposite that I'm about to tell you, but they're both true. And so let me give you another narrative. Uh, I've been part of a civil society campaign for a framework convention on global health. And so I go around the world and I meet with a lot of civil society partners, and they have a completely different view than Bill Gates. Uh, and it was interesting because when I, I had proposed either Bill Gates or Michael Bloomberg to do the, or Margaret Chan, head of WHO, to do the forward for my book. And the one good thing Harvard University Press did for me is they said, don't do that. Nobody cares what they think. Um, I said, oh, okay. <laughs> um, it's the usual thing one does with a forward with a book. They said, think of something else. So I did, and it turned out to be the best part of the book, maybe the best part of any book you've ever read, because I didn't write it. Uh, it what I did was is I went around the world uh, and with uh, uh, local advocates, interviewed children, and just said to children, tell us in your own words what your day is like. What's, what's your life like? And it was, when, when we did that, we did it in um, Dhaka and Bangladesh. Uh, we did it in India. Uh, we did it in uh, Uganda. Uh, we did it in uh, Latin America. Uh, all, basically, all in China, all around the world. And uh, these children told us their narratives. And they were very, very moving. And I'm just going to read 
a short excerpt from two of them, which can give you an indication of uh, a whole different way of thinking about health and life than the ones that you hear from the great and the good. And so the first one is uh, uh, Nemarubu's story. Um, she's a young woman living in Gaba, uh, which is a uh, suburb of Kampala uh, in Uganda. And so she writes, uh, I live in a very rowdy place. There's no clean water, no good toilets or bathrooms. I have to move a long distance every day looking for clean water to bathe, to cook. At night, the conditions worsen. There is hardly electricity. The mosquito noise fills up the place. Cockroaches move about me, and it makes me sick. Even when I fall sick, I hardly go to hospital. My mother, who would have helped me out with medication fees, is living with AIDS. Life is too hard and complicated for me. I have to cook food for my brother and myself. She's just a child. This forces me to cook one meal a day for I lack money to access the food we need to get healthy. And a lot of violence happens to me and my friends. We were raped, robbed, our property stolen. I'm thinking of one day getting a job, maybe an education. However, I w don't have enough money to do that. I'm so sad, I need a new life. Even though I've read that so many times, it makes me cry. Um, and then the other idea that I had for these global health narratives, because people in the United States and Western Europe, Australia, think, well, global health is something way over there. And so I interviewed people, aboriginals in Australia, uh, and I've been doing a lot of work with um, uh, American Indians here in the United States. And I'd spent, I've spent a long time uh, at the Blackfeet Tribal Reservation in Montana. Uh, and I hope you ask me questions about that reservation because it makes me so angry. It's, the health is appalling. In fact, uh, the av what do you think is the average life expectancy for a male there, 47 years old, um, worse than a lot of places in the world. What do you think is the health of children that were born there? 65% of all babies born on the reservation last year were um, born uh, with alcohol or drug deficits because their parents we're taking those things. And so this is Johnny's story. He's, 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 he, he lives on the uh, Blackfeet Reservation. And this is so typical American. I love when I read this. Uh, I, I, I really use a twang when I'm abroad and so people can tell it's a real yank. I start my days with a cup of joe. Then I corral, ride, and break horses. And I smoke a bowl of, bowl of weed about six or seven times if I have it. Otherwise, I smoke whatever shows up. It's a stress reliever. My father uses drugs. He snorts coke in front of me. He takes my birthday money. He even did a line of coke with me, and he uses alcohol ever since before I was born. My dad was abusive to all of us. He was verbally abusive, and he beat us with a belt. When your family is broken to the drugs and alcohol, everyone is hurt. It makes me mad when people in the community do these heavier drugs. What I mean is, what little kids get to eat, not to eat? Did they get shoes or clothes they need? It depends on whether adults do drugs. I know that it can't be stopped. It's hopeless. Um, but it's unfair that grown-ups get what they want and children do without. I want to shout, when you do meth, hey, don't let your kids see you. If I could, I would turn our reservation into a dry reservation and no gambling. My life is gone, but what about the kids? Uh, again, it's very, very moving. 
So how can we change this dynamic? How can we achieve? They're both narratives I've told you. One is a narrative of health improvement, and the other is a narrative of injustice. And so what our goal needs to be is global health with justice. Uh, and that's why the title of the talk, Imagining Global Health with Justice. And I use this term advisedly. I don't say global health justice because you can actually have an ever-improving state of health in the population, but it can be unequitably distributed. And I don't think that's good enough. I'll give you a good example of that. I am, for some unknown reason, on a very small elite list of absolute zealots, anti-tobacco zealots. I notice you have a, a, a tobacco-free campus now. And uh, they are always just sending emails and discussions just among the 15 of us. And it's all people from all around the world, but just 15. And they're all very, and they basically what they're interested is in and what's called end games in tobacco. The idea is, is, is that you could achieve that we're stuck, that the high income countries, particularly in the uh, progressive cities, are now down to about 20% prevalence in, in smoking, which is way down, some down to 18, even 15. But we're stuck there with the same policy taxation, marketing restrictions, public smoking bans. But how do we shift and to get down to near zero? And near zero would be 5% or under. That's the end game. And normally, when they go at it, recently they've been going at each other on e-cigarettes, which they really are, you know, fight about enormously. But when they did that, I don't usually enter the conversation because I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm interested, but I'm not at the same uh, level of zeal that they are. But I decided I would ask them a question. And so I said, okay, let me give you an ethics question, a hypothetical ethics question. What if you won? What if you could achieve what you want? That is, you could get to the end game, but that you would still have relatively high rates of smoking among the very poor, the mentally ill, the homeless. And so they would maybe come down a tick in their prevalence, but they'd still be very, very high, something like one out of every six, three cigarettes smoked in the United States is smoked by a person with mental illness, just as, as one example. And every single one of them said, Oh, we'd be delighted because we would have achieved our goal. But I thought that that was wrong because you, there you have a state of global health, but not with justice. And what we need to do is to have both. And so this talk is really to try to think about how we can get both of those things. So it may seem like a, almost a foolish question to ask, what would an ideal state of, of health be or global health be? But it's not. In fact, we organize our system entirely opposite of what you would need to have an ideal state of global health. Because what we do is we organize it according to specific diseases, and we measure it by those diseases. So the question is, is how many people are on antiretroviral drugs? How many vaccines did we get into kids? Um, what policies have we implemented um, for tobacco? Um, how many uh, child attendants, uh, uh, how many birth attendants are there for women giving birth? Now, these are all very, very important things but they're not an ideal state of health. And so, for example, uh, the WHO, uh, I mean, it's, the WHO is in a sad state of affairs anyway. I mean, in fact, 
I was on a, a high-level panel with, the, with the, the, the World Bank and NIH uh, recently. If you want, it's actually on C-SPAN. You could, um, you could, you could uh, link to it. And, and the question was posed on Ebola. If Ebola is Katrina, who's FEMA? Who do you think? Sadly, it's the WHO. But WHO basically has, um, gives almost no money to mental health, even though it's a huge burden. There's like two people, as, far, as long as I've known, in the office that are, that are professionals in mental health. Injuries which devastate the world, the poor world, nothing. Non-communicable diseases, diabetes, obesity, cancer, heart disease, very, very little. Um, and now they've even reduced their budget for infectious disease rapid response, which is why we've got to Ebola. So as you can see, I don't think that what we do in the world, or what the Gates Foundation does for that matter, even though it's very important, I have great admiration, and I'm I, more than admiration, I've got great love for the WHO, and I admire what the Gates Foundation and others and have done, and Michael Bloomberg are just fantastic. But it's not what a state of global health, an ideal state, would look like. What would it be? Basically, we need three things to make us healthy. One, we need health care. We need universal access to health care. Um, where universal and equitable access to health care. Um, all of the nursing, medical services, birth attendance, and other things that we might need. The second thing we need are public health services. Public health services are um, disease surveillance. Uh, their, their tax policy on uh, tobacco. Uh, their uh, vector control to, uh, to, to get rid of plague-ridden rats or malarial uh, uh, contaminated uh, mosquitoes. They're clean water, the nutritious food. Uh, all of those things are the public health approach, tobacco control, alcohol control, injury prevention. These are all public health services, which are not, surprisingly, health care services. Um, so you have medicine and nursing on the one hand, but you also have population-based, not individual-based services on the other, which are very important. And then the third thing that's essential for our health has nothing to do or very little to do with the health sector at all. It's the socioeconomic determinants of health. It's things like income, social status, uh, it's um, uh, employment, it's housing. Uh, people ask me if you could do one thing for global health in the world, what would you do if you could wave a magic wand? Easy answer, educate women. Educate women, they, they raise healthy families, and you have healthy populations, healthy communities. Sadly, we don't educate women around the world uh, like we do in the United States. Um, and so those are the three things, but our priorities are all wrong. Now, I want to take, even though socioeconomic determinants are, uh, the, are the most important, I'm going to take it off the table because it's not a health sector, just for now. Although I do want to give you a little factoid since uh, Sean gave us not some nice factoids at the beginning. It's not, on socioeconomic determinants, it turns out it's income Absolute income is actually very important. But what's even more important is relative status to your peers. So if you're inferior to your peers, and don't ever be, um, then you're less healthy. So it turns out that if you're nominated for an Academy Award, you live a lot longer than if you, you aren't. And it turns out if you win, you live longer than if you lose. <laughs> Just a little factoid. The other th fact about how powerful this is, you know, if you, any of you have been to D.C. Uh, and gone on the red line, 
It may not have, but basically the red line goes from poor southeast D.C. to richer northwest D.C. For every stop on the red line, your life expectancy increases several years. Amazing, isn't it? Just by where you live. Uh, and I think that, that speaks volumes. But I'm actually going to take that off the table. Most people think, if you ask Anybody in the world, it's not just Americans, you ask anybody in the world, what do you want for your health? They'll all give you actually what I consider to be the wrong answer. I want all the essential drugs I can get. I want all of the doctors I can see. I want, and in America, we want to see a specialist, but not only a specialist, this specialist that I can choose. Because I know that that specialist is better than this one even though you really don't. Um, and so I thought, how on earth am I going to convince people that the public health or population-based approach to health should be a priority, and yet we spend almost nothing on it? Even in the most developed countries like the United States, we spend less than 5%, maybe 1% in many cases, or 2%, given to, of all of our health dollars on public health. The rest we spend on medicines and health care. And most people are fine with that. And you know, when we say we have the right to health, we usually mean we have the right to health care. It's not what we should mean. And so I thought, well, how can I convince people of this? And so I was writing the last chapter of my book, and I was stuck on it. I just didn't know what to write. And I'd just come back um, from... It was actually Kampala, but any large urban sub-Saharan African city, this is true of. And in fact, it's true uh, when I go to any of the poor places in the world. I was coming back from Kampala, and I just wasn't feeling that well. I mean, a lot of my friends come back and they have malaria. I didn't. Um, but I wasn't feeling that well. I just saw, you know, bad throat. I was, I could, I couldn't breathe because of all the diesel smoke. I, just a, not a very good stomach. Just, and that happens whenever I come back from a very poor country. But hey, you know, I go to um, Berkeley, feeling good. Go to Oslo, nice. Melbourne. Oh, I love it. So, but why is it that when I go to some of these places, I feel so bad? And when I go to other places, I feel so good. I haven't seen a doctor in any of them. It's because of the way that you live. And so I thought, well, how can I try to convey this idea in the book? So I did as a thought experiment. And I've done this thought experiment everywhere in the world. Everywhere, well, not everywhere, but every region except Antarctica. <laughs> um, but every continent. And it's, the answer to this thought, Rawlsian thought experiment was one that is universal. Everybody. There's usually one or two people in the audience that go the other way, and they probably will be here because it's a large audience. But here it is. So you imagine you're um, in a Rawlsian state of ignorance. So, you're, you, you basically, you don't know if you're rich or poor, male or female, although John Rolfe didn't do male and female, but I'll, I'll do male and female. You don't know if you're um, black or white, if you were born in Dhaka and ba Bangladesh, or you were born um, in, uh, uh, in San Francisco. Uh, and uh, you just literally, you didn't know if you were sick or well, and, or whether you were going to be sick or well or disabled or not. In other words, you're in a state of ignorance. Given that, you have to choose between two stark choices. And so you can just imagine yourself now. One choice is, is that you're in healthcare nirvana. You can see any doctor you want. You can go to any hospital in the world. You can get any medicines, including the, the, the latest state of genetically altered medicines and, and uh, biologic medicines and things like that. You can get great surgery. You can go to the Mayo Clinic. You can do whatever you want. Um, or you could never see a doctor again the rest of your life. 
uh, and you wouldn't be able to. But you would get up every morning and you would turn on the tap and there'd be clean water. Uh, you would uh, eat nutritious food. Uh, you would have, uh, you would go outside and you wouldn't be attacked by malarial or dengue infected uh, mosquitoes. Um, there wouldn't be rubbish everywhere. You could breathe uh, clean air. You wouldn't have, you would have tobacco and alcohol control so that you wouldn't be inundated with uh, smoke. Uh, that would be the kind of life you would live. And if you had to choose between those two, how many would choose the health care? Usually there's one or two, but not nobody. How many people would choose the state of public health nirvana? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost obvious, but it's not quite obvious. There would, I would pause about a few things there. Um, one of them uh, is that I would, um, I would really worry if I got an infection and I couldn't have an antibiotic. But that's not a, you know, even though we have an antibiotic crisis at the moment because of drug resistance, um, those are usually generic cheap, cheap medications. But well, I think it gets to the point about why public health is very important. Now, I used to say that although we only, I used to tell audiences, I said, well, you know, even though the United States, Western Europe, Australia, others only devote less than 5% of their health dollars to public health, nonetheless, the political community, the public, would never tolerate the things that happen every day in sub-Saharan Africa or parts of South, Southeast Asia or lot, lot, Latin America, a lot of places in the world, maybe most places in the world, which is if there were a public health disaster, like your water wasn't clean, or in the United States, if all of a sudden we were descended upon by malaria, um, we'd be outraged. And that was, used to, that was a hypothetical, but it turned out that the hypothetical came true. It was here in West Virginia. Um, when the uh, drinking water was contaminated. And it was on the front page of the New York Times day after day after day. But when we do global health, nobody gives money for that. We give money to put people on antiviral medication um, for HIV. But we're not going to you know, allow them to turn on their tap and have clean water because that's not important for health. But yet, it's something we would never allow here. So the second question is, how do we achieve global health with justice? I know I'm running out of time, so I'll do it very, very quickly. Global health with justice is, uh, as you could tell from what I've talked about, very important to me. And it's important um, because I think that justice and equity, and particularly in a, in a law school, um, law is but the means, but justice is our end. And notice one thing about what I've said, because normally when you think of justice, and you probably learn this in your kind of political theory classes and things, justice is normally about on one word. Can anybody think of what that word is? It's distribution, redistribution. Um, but notice, we have a, fi you know, a fairly you know, left of center president, um, although by global standards, just a tick left of center. Um, and there's one word the White House will never use, and that word is redistribution. But that's exactly what they want to do. They want to change the tax system. They want to change subsidies. They want to create opportunities for employment, early education for the poor. These are all redistributive policies. But redistribution is not a term that politicians want to use. And it occurred to me that this public health approach has another benefit for justice, is, is that in many ways it gets us a long way, not all the way, you still need redistribution, but it gets us a long way to justice 
without redistribution. Because if there are no malarial infected mosquitoes and you go outside, the rich and the poor equally benefit. Um, if, and this is uh, qualified a little by where you live, but if, if we guarantee as, as a government and as a community that when you turn your tap on, it's clean water, whenever anybody turns their tap on, the problem is, is that everybody has a tap. Uh, but the public health approach can get you a ways to justice. And then, of course, you do need redistribution. You do need some amount of uh, attention to the poor. So when I talk about uh, health, I usually talk about health improvement, but with a particular attention or particular focus on the disadvantage. And so I think you need both. Uh, both embed justice in your environment, and which is not the case, for example, in a tribal reservation, anything but. Um, and you then you redistribute. And so I think that's how you achieve global health with justice. Now, in terms of uh, how you get there, I think I might, what I might do is just leave it now for you to ask questions. You can ask me how you get there. Um, but I also wanted to, it depends on how much time I've got in. What do you think? I, I want to leave time for questions. Okay, so I'll just take a few minutes because I think what I want to do is, is use Ebola. Um, this is not normally toward, part of my talk, but as I say, I've been inundated by it by, to talk about how, how you can achieve a state of global health with justice, or in this case, how we clearly did not achieve it when we so easily could have. So I hear a lot of people... In fact, I was on NPR and uh, in one of the uh, question and answer things. I, I, I don't know if I would. I'm actually going to be on again, I think it's maybe on Monday, about the, about the uh, uh, lockdown in, in uh, Sierra Leone. Um, but this was a lot of questions and answers. And one of the listeners asked me a question that actually got me really, uh, you know, a little bit upset. They basically, they said, their only concern is, will Ebola get here? Um, and when I said, uh, which is what I'm going to say to you, yes, it will eventually land on our step. But we will quickly contain it. Any developed country with a halfway decent functioning public health system is going to quickly contain it. And then they responded by saying, oh, well, that's all right then. It's not all right because we could have, should have quickly contained it in West Africa. It's, Ebola is one of the easiest diseases to contain because it's not like influenza. It's not airborne. You don't, you know, you can't catch it airborne. But uh, there are a few characteristics of it. One is is that if you touch somebody that has Ebola, um, whether it's their blood, their saliva, uh, their sweat. Um, it's highly infectious, and it also lingers on surfaces. Um, but we normally, and the other scary thing about it, it's scary in human terms, but in biological terms it's actually good, it is that it kills you, and it kills you rapidly. Um, now, that's not good <laughs> from a human point of view because Ebola may be the worst horrible way to die that there is. So you basically bleed out of every organ of your body. Um, and it's, it's just a horrible, horrible way to die. But we've had a, more than 25 outbreaks in sub-Saharan Africa before, never before in West Africa. And we quickly contained it, even there. Um, because it was in a rural area. Basically, what you do is what we would do if it were, you know, in, in, if, if it came to Morgantown or Charleston or if it, or if it was in New York or Atlanta. Um, we'd basically, we'd identify it. We'd send it to a lab. We would confirm it. Um, we would 
isolate that person. We would then contact trace all of their exposed people. We would isolate them, and then it would quickly burn out because the people who, it, who had it would die and it wouldn't spread. And that's what happened in, in Sub-Saharan Africa in the last 25 times. We quickly, fairly quickly, snuffed out. Um, but why wasn't it in this case? This, my friends who really know global health say that this is the worst public health disaster in their living memory. And when my people at the CDC, the head of the CDC group, group that's fighting Ebola said this, and he's been in the wars now for 30 years. He said this, he's never, ever seen anything like it. It is horrifying, entirely preventable if we had uh, decent health systems. So basically, what happened was in Guinea, uh, in a rural area, just like in other places, two-year-old boy got malaria. He probably, you know, he might have gotten it, um, we don't know, uh, probably exposure to a fruit bat. Or as maybe his family was uh, fed him bush meat. Um, but he, somehow he got it. We don't know how. Um, but then it was undetected for a long period of time. Uh, and then the worst disaster happened. It, it spread to c congested, poor capital cities. And then it spread internationally from Guinea to Sierra Le Leone to Liberia. Now uh, it's in Lagos. Now, it's actually, this form of Ebola um, is much less lethal than others. It's so far, it's got a death rate of about 55%, whereas in other outbreaks, it was up to 90% of people who had it died. So how, how could we have prevented it? Simple. Just use the tools that I just mentioned. You have decent health system so that you can actually identify cases, send them to confirmatory laboratories, have sterile um, isolation facilities, and then train public health workers who can go into villages and contact trace, find the exposed, bring them. But we never did any of that. And the WHO took a half a year to declare a public health emergency under the international health regulations, uh, their own international health regulations, uh, which is the, the most widely adopted treaty in the world. Uh, every WHO member state is a member of it. Uh, six months after the first international spread, by then it was totally out of control. It's out of control now. When it will end, I don't know. Um, I was saying that we could get it under, you know, maybe get it under control in a half a year. Now my friends are telling me it could be two years. And it's really, really bad and so unnecessary. All the suffering, so unnecessary. The health system, including public health, and you could have snuffed this out. And so what I've been recommending uh, in medical journal articles like The Lancet and, and, and JAMA uh, have been uh, a health systems fund, an international health systems fund, um, so that we can have a rapid response to these kinds of diseases, and also a longer-term health systems fund to build health systems. That is, maybe this is an opportunity for us to change global health priorities to build these kind of systems that would not only prevent Ebola, but it would also lower injury rates, it would provide treatment for diabetes, cancer, and the like, and just do something that any basic civilized country should have, which is a decent health system. So with that, I'll stop. Um, we can have a conversation, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Some of the upper level um, students might have class, so if you can um, very nonchalantly walk out. And if you have, I know some of the 1Ls might have like a child care issue, and if you need to, we understand. But we will take 
a few minutes for, for question and answer otherwise. And please come to the microphone if you're interested. Dr. Paul. Thank you. It was a wonderful talk. My name is Ranjita Misra, and I'm a professor in the School of Public Health. I work in Mexico, India, United States as a health disparities researcher. And my focus is diabetes. And my question to you is, we talked about Ebola, which has been there for a long time. Actually, the first outbreak was in Zaire, Africa, in 1977. So um, when it comes to non-communicable disease, as it is called globally, instead of chronic disease. There is no threat. There is no, um, of course, I work in uh, poor countries, and uh, the percent of GDP or GNP uh, by the government for this non-communicable diseases are very, very little, 2 3% or less. And we have people who don't have access to health care. So you're talking about a health systems approach, which is a very, very good approach. Uh, but I'm not sure how you are layering social justice with that for non-communicable disease. Well, um, I think I've indicated how important social determinants of health are, and they, and they are. Um, uh, but you, have to, you, you really have to change society totally for that. You have to make sure that you've got universal education, you have, that, that, that people are employed, that they have housing and, and the like. Um, I, I wrote an article just a couple of months ago. You might want to read it in, in the journal Nature. It's one of the, the, the uh, really good uh, scientific journals. And it was on uh, the the, the governance of non-communicable diseases. I think it was, it, it's called uh, healthy, li healthy Living Needs Good Governance was the title of it. Uh, and it really looked at um, the major drivers of non-communicable diseases, particularly uh, those that are related to overweight and obesity but, uh, and, and borrowing from tobacco, which has been quite successful. But the way we've really dramatically changed tobacco uh, 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 prevalences in the United States and in Western Europe, even more so in Australia, um, is high taxes, um, uh, bans on, on, on selling to, to children, uh, public uh, smoking bans, um, and uh, strong marketing restrictions with the Framework Convention on tobacco control, but we don't do that with food or alcohol, uh, and I think that that is a, a, a missed opportunity. I mean, my, my sons, when they say I suck the joy out of life, it's because I get started about food, as Anne knows. <laughs> She's, you know, like last night at dinner, Anne was saying, well, can I eat this, Larry? <laughs> she said, well, yeah, but go a little, you know. I won't talk about it. You and I have to have a conversation. <laughs> um, so uh, I think there are, there are ways to govern uh, and really improve NCDs, and tobacco is, I think, a great paradigm for it. But, we, but for some reason, tobacco, tobacco went from a, uh, you know, a, a, an accoutrement of a good life to one where the tobacco industry and even smokers themselves are pariahs. Uh, but with the food industry, they can sneak anything into your food. They can advertise to children in insidious ways. They can, you know, if they say it's low fat, it means it's high calorie, high sugar, high sodium. If they say it's low sodium, it means it's high fat. They put sugar and salt in your peanut butter, in your bread, everything that you eat, um, don't be fooled. It takes me hours in the supermarket just to choose something because they're trying to constantly trick you. But we let it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. I like your response of a healthy living, which is top three chronic diseases in the U.S. and elsewhere is yeah. due to lifestyle. 
we have cardiovascular disease, we have cancer, and we have stroke, the top three. Yep. Diabetes is down like sixth or seventh. <laughs> and respiratory. Yes, yeah. COPD. Yeah. Thank you. So thank you first, Professor, for uh, your talk. It was uh, quite informative. Uh, my name is Warren Hillsboss, and I'm a, a second year student. And um, my question has to do with culture in particular. It seems like particularly in, in the last question and answer, um, culture has been kind of an underpinning element of various things, particularly in public health. So you, you would agree that was the first part of my question. My second part of the question was, um, are there any particular like common elements or patterns to cultures uh, around the world that seem to be direct, more directly related to public health? Yeah. Um, well, let me give you an Ebola example of culture, and then I'll give you a much more generalized one. Um, it's really thought that, does anybody know what has been the hyper-transmission in uh, West Africa. I mean, a lot of it is healthcare workers. There's over 150 who've died. In, in, so it's decimated the already pathetically low uh, human resources there. But it's actually um, a burial practices, cultural burial practices, where people bathe and touch uh, and, and, and embrace the dead. Um, the corpse is still infected. Then, they're, then they, they cry and they hug each other, um, and then they span out, they, they spread out. It's just a terrible cultural, it's not a terrible cultural practice, but for this public health purpose, it's a very bad one. Um, but in food is a, is a great example. And chapter two of the book is about health, globalization and health. Because there used to be, you know, places in the world, a lot of places in the world, where obesity was a problem for the rich and the privileged. We, Amer we, we Americans were fat, but people weren't fat elsewhere because they were eating you know, fish, vegetables, rice, things. But with globalization, it's homogenized everything. Just like if you go around the world, everybody's wearing American jeans watching American television. They're also eating American food. I often say if you go to any major city in the world, go to Delhi, uh, go to New York, uh, go to um, uh, 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 Buenos Aires, go anywhere, and you do a 365 degree turn, you'll see the same thing in this city. What will you see? McDonald's. Starbucks. Yeah, that's a sad thing. <laughs> I noticed you have one out here, bad choice. <laughs> um, <laughs> what else? Burger King, Dunkin' Donuts, all that. And Subway says it's healthy. I mean, that's just a marketing tool of great deception. <laughs> so thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I told you I sucked the joy out. <laughs> Uh, uh, this is not really regarding global health law, but I'm curious where you come down on this situation where uh, public health interventions may um, contradict uh, rights as imagined by the First Amendment and Fourth Amendment yeah, I spend a regarding lot of time immunizations, on that. Uh, uh, drug testing for pregnant women, things of that yeah, sort. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the court cases around uh, tobacco and the First Amendment would be a great example of that. I mean, is there any, where, where, do, where do you come down on that? I mean, do people... Well, you know, I, I've, uh, and I might even share it with you if you want to share it with your students. Students tend to really like it. It's an art, I wrote an autobiographical article in the Journal of Law and Society, and it's called From a Civil Libertarian to a Sanitarian. And the reason I, that is is because I began my life, first of all, as a mental health advocate. I went to the European Court of Human Rights, the only American you know, fighting for justice for the mentally ill. And then I became the head of the British equivalent of the ACLU. So I was, I was, I was really a civil libertarian. And I've become now a, a sanitary, an in, from an individualist to a collectivist. Because I think rights are very important. There's no question about it. Um, but so is our duties to one another as a society. And we forget that we're embedded in, this, in, in families and in communities and societies that profoundly affect us. Um, and so I've been writing on paternalism and, and obesity and health 
you know, because people think, oh, well, we don't, it's, obesity is not about public health. It's, it's nanny Bloomberg obesity. But because we can make choices, we can decide whether we smoke, whether we eat what we eat, and so forth. But the truth is, and, 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 I, and I could spend a lot of time on this, the truth is, is that we're so heavily influenced by uh, information we receive, the people around us, the culture around us, that, it, that, that we need to also pay attention to that. So yes, rights are important, but we also need to recognize that we live in communities, and communities and the health of populations and families are just as important. Thank you. Thanks so much. I really enjoy that. My name is Michael Blumenthal. I teach here. I, I, I want to ask you a kind of abstract political question, if sure. I can. Uh, you used that dirty political word redistribution, you know, and uh, it seems to me the whole world is the red line, uh, you know, uh, and this country is the red line too with the Blackfoot reservation being stop one and we're at DuPont Circle or something like yeah. that here. But um, it seems to me that virtually all our problems, medical, political, economic, have to do with di distribution of wealth in this world, uh, which is only getting worse in many countries like this country. Yeah. And that it's very hard to separate the question of redistributive health from redistributive justice, economic justice. So my question is, and traditionally most redistributions of wealth have taken place through violence, revolution, etc. So my question is, how do you separate or can you separate health justice from world yeah. economic justice? Yeah. Um my civil society partners are always asking me that question. <laughs> Sorry. They're always push. They're always. They're always pushing me there. Um, well, first of all, I do think you're right, <laughs> uh, and you make an astute observation. I mean, I, I do believe that um, not equal, but a more equitable uh, distribution of benefits and burdens, goods and harms. Uh, would be um, uh, would be good for not just health but life, um, but it's but it's hard to get there as we know. Uh, it's extremely hard to get there, and it should be a goal that we should have. But where I differ from my civil society partners is that I don't want, like they, like many of them are, completely disabled by their by achieving the perfect. And they don't, they can't, they, they don't want to kind of move to something that is much more achievable and concrete, um, which is a fairer distribution of the goods of health. Uh, and you can do that in the ways that I've talked about. I actually think that if, uh, and maybe I'm sorry if this sounds um, uh, immodest, but I actually think if I were uh, offered the opportunity to change the way we structured our health society, that I could make a healthier population without spending any more money and probably less than we do now. Uh, so it's achievable. Um, we just don't do it. I hope you get the job. <laughs> <laughs> I think the dean of this law school gets to a point, right? <laughs> Oh, oh, one more question. Sorry. Okay. How are you doing? My name is Suna Halley. I'm a first year MPH student at HPML, and it's an honor to meet you. We're actually going over your 2008 publication on public health law, so it's good to put a face to the literature that we just read. Um, I have two questions for you. I'm from Liberia, directly um, affected. Grandparents, they are first generation here, so this topic hits home for myself. And um, in the United States, our response to access and health services, like you said, is kind of based on the distinction between the poor and the advantage. I mean, the poor and the upper class and um, their, uh, what is it called? Their uh, access to health care services. In these poor nations where social class are not easily defined, how do you increase um, access to care? How can you um, go into the rural communities and into the... Um, 
you're going into rural communities and interior communities and things like that to get access of health care. It's hard. And visiting there, um, it's not like here where you can get on a highway and easily access these people. You have to go hours, two hours out and I mean, how, how do you get access care to them? And the second thing that you said today that really hit home for me is that it's going to take two or three years to actually get relief to these um, places. And why do you think that is? Well, I'll take the last one first. I mean, I, the, the, the question I was raising is, is how long will it take to get the Ebola outbreak under control? Okay. And um, it was thought that it would be under control in weeks or a month. Then, well before the WHO said it, I said it would be six months. Now, most of my friends are saying it, it could be a couple of years. The, the nightmare would be, and we don't know the answer. I've asked this of very, very smart people. Um, could it ever be that Ebola would become endemic in some of these uh, West African cities? It would be horrible. Um, it wouldn't be epidemic, but it would become endemic. And that, you know, I hope that won't happen, but they said it's possible. And that would be the worst case scenario. But so, I'm, so if we can bring it under control, I think we should. You know, getting universal health systems is hard. I mean, it's the WHO's highest priority. I don't know if any of you are following, you all know the Millennium Development Goals, right? Um, uh, they're, they're, they're the UN goals for um, uh, development at, at the turn of the millennium. Uh, but they're about to expire in 2015 and um, actually going to the General Assembly uh, in, in, I think, only a week uh, where they're going to be discussing the post-MDG goals, which are now the UN's and Ban Ki-moon's calling the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, the WHO wants one of the sustainable, sustainable development goals to be universal health coverage, although Bill Gates and other very powerful actors are very much against that, you know, for, for reasons I could tell you. Um, and, uh, but universal health coverage, uh, we need to fund it. Um, but the question is what it means. I'm actually writing an article now. It's a really interesting one because I'm writing it. I don't know if any of you know Zeke Emanuel. Um, but Zeke, he's the brother of, of, of the, chief, the old chief of staff now, the, 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 mayor, the mayor of Chicago. But he actually was the architect of the Affordable Care Act. And him and I are writing an article together, uh, counterintuitively, about why universal health coverage, as it's currently conceived, is not enough and is not what we should aspire to, even though he wrote the Affordable Care Act, which is all about that. Um, because we want to put in this public health approach. So I think that there are, all developed countries have been able to uh, provide for reasonable access. I mean, the United States has been the, the outlier, but we're, we're moving in the right direction. Reasonable access to health care for their population. I think it's possible to do. It's harder in the rural areas, for sure. Definitely. I mean, I'm, so for example, I'm, I gave that, that thought experiment in Beijing and Shanghai a little while ago. And I did have one question. And she said, how on earth are you going to get health care in China? You know, all these rural populations, you know, it seems overwhelming. But you can certainly get a long way there. We really do know how to do this. It's not it can be done, it can be at an affordable cost. We need to have shared responsibility. The governments themselves need to invest in it. And you know, when I first wrote in this field, I was like the typical white guilt. And I, you know, I'd say, it, everything has to do with how ungenerous the rest of the world is. But the truth is, is that in many of these poor countries, there's corruption. They don't provide services for health. They build presidential palaces. There's cronyism. We have to hold them accountable. That's what the law does. That's what the rule of law should do. But we also need to do our part and to give well, not charitably, but give well and give um, for the right priorities in the right ways. So I think we can actually do this. I mean, it's daunting, but it can be done. Never give up. 
There are light refreshments out, outside, none of which are healthy. Um, <laughs> but before, before we go there, um, we the mountain, sign. yeah, and oh yes, and there's a book signing and you can purchase Professor Gostin's book and he will, he will sign the, um, the book. I just purchased it myself and, um, I'll, I'll have you sign mine later. Um, but before we do that, I just want to say thank you. We Mountaineers are, consider ourselves among, or are told we are among the most generous people in the world. We are warm, we are friendly, we welcome, we're welcoming, and we always are grateful. And we are very grateful, and this is just a small token of our appreciation for you coming here and um, twice. Many of you don't know is that Professor Gostin was supposed to speak last year, and there was a big snowstorm, and he got the last plane out of, out of D.C., came here, trekked through the snow, on and then Super we... Super Bowl night when my kids were at home. Watching. Right, on Super Bowl <laughs> Sunday. To come here in a snowstorm. And then we canceled the lecture on him. <laughs> but we took him... Uh, Professor Tu took him uh, skiing... Um, and we had dinner with him at table nine, and we showed him a good time with um, with great. some of the some of the fun faculty like well, we're all fun, anything. but anyway. Um, so we just want to say thank you so oh, much. Okay. Go Mountaineers! Go Mountaineers. <laughs>